At the westernmost limits of Britain sit two proud neighbours. Devon. No one ever sees the scenery that I see, and it is absolutely fantastic. And across the River Tamar, Cornwall. How can you not walk through this and feel your soul lift? With a drawn here. It was amazing going through the tunnel for the first time. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> or born here. Good to meet you. I'm Jack. What's your name? There are many deep-rooted folk. Our family's been doing that in Devon since the 1300s. There's nowhere better, is there? Living off the lush land. Gorgeous runner beans. They're going to the market tomorrow. And stunning seas. Look at those beauties. You can't get fresher than that. Passionately preserving traditions old. Being a Cornishman to work on this is a very special moment. And new. A massively competitive part. I want to just live that childhood dream. In the place they call home. We pinch ourselves every day. So lucky to be able to call this home. These are their stories. This is Devon and Cornwall. Spreading out over 200 acres within a stone's throw of the beautiful Cornish coast are magical gardens adrift in time, the lost gardens of Heligan. Tropical plants, hidden woodland, and a restored tradition of horticultural pioneering which have been developed and nurtured for more than 250 years. Part of the Tremaine estate since the 16th century, Heligan lies just outside the fishing village of Mevagissi on the South Cornish coast. Heligan's reputation was cultivated by experimenting with exotic plants from foreign climes. It really does feel like a sea when you walk through it, doesn't it? But now head of gardens Alastair Moore is sowing the seeds of a technicolor future which is entirely homegrown. I have to say, this is the best thing I've ever been involved with. He has helped create Heligan's first ever commercial wildflower meadow. To be able to do something on this scale has been fantastic. How can you not walk through this and feel your soul lift? And this 15-acre spectacular is just the beginning. I think initially, we just love it because it looks amazing. It's just a real visual treat. But on a secondary level, it's also really, really important in terms of the work it's doing to help support pollinators. Our pollinators are under serious threat. We've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows nationally. And so providing habitat for insects that go on to help provide us with our food is really critical. Alistair's master plan is to harvest the seeds from this colourful crop every summer and sell them on to other farms and estates across Cornwall. Today, he's taking stock of his blooms. We've come out this morning just to have a little bit of a look and a feel of what's happening in terms of the balance of flowers that have gone over, flowers that may be still in bud, and what's actually fully open. And the critical thing, as with all harvests, is hitting it when it's actually at its height for seed collection. If Alistair's glorious vision blossoms, whole swathes of Cornwall's countryside could be carpeted in multicolored meadows. But the next few weeks will be crucial. I think at this stage, the only concern I would have is if we have like a weather event, because a one major enemy to us harvesting uh, this seed is wet. And uh, if the crop is wet, the uh, issue we'll then have with drying the seed before it gets cleaned will be severe. Yeah, no rain now would be good. One month later, 
and the big wheels are in motion. Heligan's horticultural hero has rattled up a combine harvester to reap what he has sown. It's been a glorious display through July and August, and now timing's perfect. So uh, it's going to be a good day, I hope. Fingers crossed. <laughs> it's a momentous day, and it seems like Alasdair's rolling in clover. It's going well. The quality of the end product at this stage is pretty good. And, you know, we've probably got about 60 kilos already, and there's a, <laughs> a lot more to come. So, you know, I'm feeling very, very pleased. And um, the sun's out, the, there's birds and bees everywhere. You know, what's not to love? It all bodes well for a great harvest. With the harvesting of the wildflower seeds in full flow, Alistair must make sure that the precious produce is saved and dried quickly. So the fruits of his labour are spread out in the Heligan greenhouses. That will allow the residual moisture to be um, sort of burnt off, as it were. But what it needs is raking on a re regular basis, so you, you don't just form a kind of dry crust. You know, worst case scenario would be that you just cook the seed, and obviously that would be a shame. But the pressure on the project is now heating up. The cream of today's crop is promised to a nearby Cornish landowner, and the success of Alistair's ambitious scheme will rely on just the right climatic conditions. While some must wait months to reap the rewards of their harvest, for others, good fortune turns on the labor of a single busy day. Off the south coast of Devon, dramatic cliffs and jagged rocks are soaked by sparkling seas. The sunrise paints a golden rainbow luring generations of fishermen who have headed out to the lonely sea in the sky in pursuit of the perfect catch. Lying across the bay from Torquay, Brixham is a fishing town worth its salt. A port since at least the time of William the Conqueror, fishing is in the blood of the people born and bred here. It's not a job, it's a way of life, and I love it. People like Tristan Northway, I'm proud to be part of the fleet, and I'm proud I'm a Brixham fisherman at the end of the day. Still one of the busiest and largest ports in the UK, Brixham's trawler fleet blinks into life in the early hours. It is 2.30 in the morning, and we are just about to set off to go and find some fish. I think I'm the earliest this morning. I usually am. I'm always the first out. Early bird catches the worm, so to speak. Tristan is skipper of the Adela. She is the smallest trawler in the fleet, but doesn't stop her performing. She still performs as well as the bigger boats. And his beloved boat is his pride and joy. She's a very strong-built little boat. She's been in Brixham most of her life, so... Yeah, she's a well-known, pretty little boat in Brixham. Yeah, she does me proud. While many of the larger trawlers head out offshore for a week at a time, Tristan likes to swim against the tide. The difference for me is the fleet will go one way and I'll go the other. I've always been different. I'll do my own thing, always have done, always will do. So when it comes to the fish, I am really fussy and I try and do as short as toes as possible. I drag my nets for two and a half, three hours max. Fish comes up, it is still live and kicking, there's not a mark on it. You cannot get it any fresher. Tristan needs all his insider know-how to work the finest fishing grounds at close quarters. Just inside the 12 mile limit where I'm gonna go to uh, wreck cord the fleet wing. 
about eight mile off. Hopefully just try and get there just before daylight. Hopefully have some decent flat, some nice A1 place. Fingers crossed. That's what I'm hoping for, but it's, that's what the whole game is. It's a game of hope. I hope there's something in it. <laughs> From sea to shore, he aims to bring in his catch in under three hours, and shooting the nets is the first task of the day. Right. Shoot away! Shoot away! Chains, they rumble across the bottom, create a dust cloud. The fish swim one way, see the dust cloud, scared, and then swim the other way, and then they sort of zigzag all the way down into the net. The net's just a bag at the end of it all. We are now fishing. Now, hopefully, have a good catch. Fingers crossed. But Tristan knows that trawling is a ticklish business. And today, like every day, it's a waiting game to reveal what might be up for grabs. The sun's out! Yeah! That's more like it! And what a beauty of a waiting room it is. A few dolphins around this morning. Sign of good luck. I could watch them all day. Beautiful sight, beautiful sight. Even the gannets diving down into the sea. Just the noise of the squawking seagulls, you know, it all adds to being a fisherman, being at sea and everything else, you know? No one ever sees the scenery that I see, and it is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you could be anywhere in the world with the sun shining on it. Later, in Devon and Cornwall, it's a proud day for engineer Sam. To work on this is a very special moment but he's under pressure to fix this Cornish classic. Oh, we've got a leak there coming. And Tristan hauls in his nets. Smells fishy. Always a good sign. Hoping for a bumper catch. That's the ones I want. That is absolutely spanking. Cornwall, the powerhouse of Britain's industrial revolution. Driven by copper and tin mining during the 18th and 19th centuries. Mines that harnessed homegrown steam pumps developed by pioneering Cornishman Richard Trevithick, the inventor of the world's first high-pressure locomotive engine. Being a Cornishman and living and working in Cornwall, to have the opportunity to work on this is just a once-off, really. It is a very special moment. In North Cornwall, a few miles from Newquay, in the village of Summercourt, a very special engine is undergoing a complete overhaul. Steam engineer Sam Henwood and his team have got their hands on the replica of Richard Trevithick's Puffing Devil, the world's first self-propelled steam locomotive, the vehicle that changed the world of transport forever. It was built for the bicentenary of when it was made in 1801, and now it's looked after by the Trevithick Society. Every 10 years, steam pressure vessels like this one have to have a hydraulic boiler test and a thorough examination and we've got to strip it down to have a look inside the boiler and give it any work it needs. Pretty much an MOT. It's a project that turns up the pressure on Sam. The puffing devil is quite different to what we usually deal with. We usually deal with things built in the early 20th century, whereas that was built 100 years before any of these things were. It really is a different beast altogether. But help is at hand, as Sam is working alongside members of the original crew that constructed this impressive replica in 2001. It's been 
probably close to 20 years before this lot has been apart. And their knowledge is invaluable when it comes to stripping down the boiler, especially that of John Saw, the lead engineer who designed the replica engine based on Richard Dravidic's drawings. No, we took liberties because we didn't know what the original looked like. We sort of had to make it up as we went along. Yeah. And the historic engine is something the Dravidic Society in Cornwall are rightly proud of. It's the first successful self-moving engine, and it's the forerunner of all road vehicles today. You can trace every modern road vehicle back to this one. It's a lovely thing for Cornwall. The reception it gets when it goes around is marvellous. People are so proud of it. After 30 square-headed bolts have been undone, the steel end plate and fire tube can be removed by forklift. You clear the engine. Revealing its condition for the first time in 20 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> We've got a lot of surface corrosion in the water, water space. And it looks like there's plenty of blood, soot and tears ahead for Sam to get her back in prime condition, ready for her inspection. We'll get it all cleaned out and give it a good sweep out and see what's underneath. We've just got to get the job done, I guess. For Sam and the team, reconditioning such a celebrated engine proves a painstaking and complex task. But after many hours of huffing and puffing, all their efforts have paid off. The boys have worked hard with me to put it all back together with a new gasket. We've reconditioned some of the steam taps. We've remade a few of the bolts. Uh, and then we've tightened all the bolts back up again, which is why every bolt has been crossed. The puffing devil might be looking a proper job, but that's no guarantee that she's in fully functioning working order. So we're now ready to pull it outside and raise a warming fire in it to warm all the steel work. We should then see if we've got any leaks within that will be the interesting part, usually getting them bone dry for hydraulic test on Tuesday. Slowly and carefully, the engine is inched out of the workshop into the yard. And it's the moment of truth for Sam. As full to the brim with water, the boiler is fired up. Drawing. But immediately there are warning signs. Oh, we've got a leak there coming. And there's mounting worry as more dribbles and drops appear. I think I'll probably look at these valves a bit more because they're going to cause a bit of problem and make sure the bolts don't leak because I think they could be trouble because getting there to tighten those up is quite tricky. Yeah, it might work a little bit this weekend and try and get it all buttoned up. With the engine out of action for nearly two years and with leaky elements to fix, will Sam get the puffing devil ready for her boiler inspection in just a few days' time? Off the coast of Devon, near Brixham, fisherman Tristan Northway is about to haul in his catch. Fishing's a game of hope. If you've got your gear right and you're in the right place, you'll catch fish. Smells fishy. Always a good sign. Four and bits been done now. The good bit's happening. Hopefully there's fish in it. What I'm here for. Sun's rising. People are still in bed now as well. I know I'm working. It's just ace. It's just a feeling that only certain people feel like, you know? No one else will understand it unless you're a fisherman. Being out here by yourself, doing your own thing. As the net is hoisted to the surface, Tristan is full of high hopes. See if anything's in it today, eh? Oh yeah, there's a there's a few bits and pieces in there for sure. These fish, by the time I get in, will be less than three hours old. Less than three hours old. 
All right, some people are taking them home and eating them in less than five. It's a decent conger eel, look. And a decent bass. Nice whiting. That's the ones I want. Look at that. That is absolutely spanking. It needs a place where you can just see how fresh it is, but there's not a mark on the body at all. It is absolutely pristine, and that's how you fresh fish should be. You ain't going to get that in any other restaurant anywhere in Torbay, as fresh as that. Guaranteed. I mean, look at it. Well chuffed. Anybody that gets fish like that should be happy. The hall may be safely on board, but Tristan's work is far from over. To offer his customers the freshest fish in Torbay, he needs to head home to port pronto. So it's full throttle for the Adela while Tristan deals with the gear and sorts the fish. And there's nowhere else he'd rather be. I've tried other jobs. Mother Nature keeps calling me back. It's in the blood. The old man used to be in the merch. And then he was uh, born in Timber. And then he bought one of the uh, famous angling boats out of Brixham called the Our Unity. Bless his eyes, not here anymore, but he got me into it. Took me down the quay when I was younger and showed me what's what. Since I'm selling to the public as well, I've started keeping stuff that you wouldn't normally keep. You know, like the rock salmon. You normally chuck them back. But you skin them and people, people eat them. They'll eat it if they know what to do with it. So you've also got to try and play that game as well, then. Tell them how to cook it. So I'm also a fisherman and a, a chef, recipe maker. Once the fish is packed and dressed in ice... Right, I think I'm ready, pretty much. It's absolutely spanking. Tristan's wares are prepped and primed. Brixham hoves into view. Wherever you've been, steaming around that ferry head, seeing Brixham on your distance, you get the cheapies every single time. And you feel proud. You feel proud of living here, you know? He may be confident in his catch, but like the gulls, will his customers come flocking? Later, on Devon and Cornwall, wildlife officer Jake is in for a treat. There's one swimming just there now. As a long-lost furry friend returns to Devon. It's probably this year's kit, and it's about the size of a, a, a Jack Russell. And Alistair has big plans for his floral revolution. It'd be lovely for Cornwall to become the wildflower epicenter and make it even more beautiful. Devon is a county where the water runs free. From the sea coasts to north and south, and the sweeping estuaries to the inland rivers that meander through all the points of the compass, these are the arteries that bring life to the land. The River Otter flows from the Blackdown Hills to the sea at Butley Salterton, and along the lower reaches near the village of Austin, a long-lost furry friend has returned home. The last time beavers were in this catchment was many hundreds of years ago. They were hunted to extinction in England because of their fur. We used to make fur hats, so that's the reason why they're quite rare. Jake Chant from the Devon Wildlife Trust is the man at the helm of making sure that this colony, the first licensed by the government in England for 400 years, is able to thrive. Devon's a fantastic place to work, getting to spend days in the river, um, looking at beaver dams, monitoring wildlife. It's super exciting and I, and I really love it. The once extinct native species has been reintroduced to the river otter in a five-year trial, supported by the local community, landowners and farmers. With the numbers of beavers in the river otter catchment ever increasing, Jake's come to a location where signs of a new family have been spotted. 
This dam is around uh, two to three weeks old. I had no idea that the beavers had been busy um, at this particular location, so it's quite a surprise to find it. Camera trap here will hopefully have got footage of um, the beavers building this dam and maintaining it. I hope to get an idea of how many beavers are, are using this territory. I don't know what ecologists did before they had camera traps. It's good, looks like we've got lots of videos. So there we go, fantastic. We've got definitely beavers coming up over the top of the dam, which is exciting to see. It looks like there's quite a bit of activity of beavers actually putting material on the dam. That's quite a big branch, so that's about a, a 10 foot branch the beavers are popping on the dam there. There's also evidence of another unexpected visitor who's come to check out the new neighbours. But the unflappable beaver soon sees off this curious guest. And Jake has all the information he needs to keep track of the new family. We should be able to better understand how many beavers we've got at this location. If they've got ear tags in, we know that we've, we've had them elsewhere in the catchment. We might even be able to identify where the beavers were born as kits, so how far they've travelled to get to this particular territory. Monitoring the number and location of the busy beavers helps Jake to watch over the impact of their behaviour on their stomping grounds. So we've reintroduced beavers to the River Otter, so it's really important that we're here to provide help and management support for landowners as they get used to living with beavers again. I've come to a landowner in the top of the River Otter catchment. They've got a small orchard full of lovely apple trees quite, quite close to the river. And the landowner really loves the apple trees. Uh, they love making cider. The beavers also really love apples uh, and apple trees. But Jake has a quick fix to block the beavers' nighttime apple scrumping activities. We've put this electric fence up. I just need to turn it on and to, to check the voltage to make sure it's strong enough to put the beavers off from coming in here. That's perfect. So that's strong enough um, to give the, the, the animals a small shock, but it's low enough to, to cause no harm. So it's not going to hurt the, the beavers. And the landowner gets to make some tasty cider. Beavers are nocturnal and elusive. So spotting these shy swimmers in their natural neck of the woods is no easy mission. But as dusk falls, there's one patch along the River Otter where nature lovers have the chance to catch a rare glimpse. If we're lucky tonight, we might see um, the adults, so the breeding pair. We might see older kits from last summer, and we might see the smaller kits from this summer. People from miles around have gathered, eager that the beavers will put in an appearance. The beavers might have been a bit quiet tonight, but there's one swimming just there now. And finally, their patience is rewarded as a whole family turns up for some fun and frolics. There's one just on the other side, I think. Yeah, there's one just on the other side feeding. It's quite a small one. It's probably this year's kit, and it's about the size of a, a, a Jack Russell with a tail on the end. These wild and wonderful creatures have made Devon and the banks of the River Otter their home once again. And with so many people turning up to appreciate the beauty of these sleek swimmers, Jake can be confident that with his careful management, the future of the colony looks safe for years to come. The last time beavers were in this catchment was many hundreds of years ago, so people have forgotten what beavers do. Sometimes beavers can have the most amazing impact on the landscape and on biodiversity and other times they can flood farmland. So we've got to be able to monitor the, the great activity that they do, but ready to step in and manage the situation if needed. And I feel very privileged to have that role day in, day out. So really, really fantastic. At Heligan Gardens near Mevergissey, in South Cornwall, Alistair Moore's wildflower revolution is gaining momentum. That's the last one. Lovely. Cheers, Mark. A successful summer harvest 
has reaped a bumper crop of his rich mix of important meadow seeds. He's now packing them to cast far and wide. I'm probably struggling to keep up with you, George, because I know you're the ace seed packet man of Heligan. A small proportion will be picked up by Heligan's visitors, but he's banking on the bulk of his crop being bagged by farms and big estates. You know, it's just lovely to have a deep sort of sense of provenance with these seeds. From germination to going in the packet, they have not left the premises. It's great to think of them actually then going out into the wider community and germinating and coming to flower and setting seed elsewhere. And it'd be lovely for Cornwall to become the wildflower epicenter um, and make it even more beautiful. The biggest, boldest enterprise begins as a tiny seed of an idea. And today, Alistair's dream of a huge wildflower rollout will get a major boost. He's heading more than 20 miles north to the edge of Bodmin Moor and a farm at the heart of an ambitious rewilding project. We don't need to put a lot on. It could go on any turned ground, it's absolutely fine. Farmer Merlin and his group of volunteers know that restoring Cornwall's wildflower meadows is crucial for both insects and humans. Without pollinators, all of our land would just be a, a barren, scorched earth. It is so important in the decline over the last few decades as we fertilise the pesticides has just been utterly tragic. Anything that we can do, especially with local native breeds like the Cornish black bee that we're trying to bring back, some of these solitary bee species, anything we can do to help and support them, the better. We're doing more and more farming practices using old traditional methods. And to be sowing um, wildflower seeds in a, in a method that's been used for thousands of years, it helps you to really connect with the ground again, which is really important. It may look simple, but there's a knack to getting it right. You've got a slightly I was trying a new style. Action there, I, was trying, I was trying a new style, oh, okay. but I don't think no. it worked, actually. No? Well, I don't know. Well, I, just... thought if, I thought if you fill your whole yeah. hand with seeds, you can then just shake your hand and a little bit comes okay. out each time. I don't but... know, it just reminded me of a sort of uh, a bishop with incense or yeah, something. Yeah, sort of blessing. You know, exactly. Uh, blessing yeah. the ground with seed. Yeah. It's just great to think, you know, all those months ago when our seed was just germinating, and uh, we had that beautiful flowering um, in July and August and the harvest in September. And then here we are and it's going in the ground. It's great, it feels like job done for this season. It just feels good. It's exactly the end of the process that I'd imagined. So yeah, I'm just delighted. It's early days. But Alistair's ambition to transform Cornwall into a wildflower wonderland is germinating nicely. His big belief is that the spectacular meadows he has nurtured at Heligan could be a scene replicated across Cornwall and far beyond. Later on Devon and Cornwall, the puffing devil roars into life. 85. Coming up, Sam. But will it pass its big test? They all have their own little quirks and traits. And in Devon, fish fans of all shapes and sizes... Here's Bob! Come on, then. ...snap up Tristan's latest catch. He's converted me to fish. I never had fish fish before <laughs> this boat came. My Six family's always called yeah. me John West Julie because I'd only eat John West salmon out the tin. In Brixham, skipper Tristan Northway is back in port with today's bounty. Morning. No one here yet, I'm afraid. Town may be famous for its fish market, but Tristan likes to set out his stall his own way, selling straight from the boat. The scallops, they're so fresh, they're still alive. For that fresh, I'll eat one raw. Mm. Can't beat them. 
and word is spilling out that he's back in his berth and open for business as the locals arrive to find out what's on offer. Morning. All right. What can I get you this morning? Yeah, I need some half a dozen scallops. Half a dozen scallops, OK. Do you want them in or out the shell? Yeah. You want them in the shell, yeah? To be able to catch it in the morning, to come in, sell it, and then this customer to eat it, that's what makes me proud of being a fisherman, is that little bit, is knowing that the customer is getting the absolute best quality fish and eating it the same day. I, mean, I was looking at those crabs, I was going to get some fish, but I might get some cra crab. <laughs> <laughs> I've always got Tristan's scallops and his monkfish. Love making monkfish curry. It's as fresh as anything. It's just been in the sea two hours early, and there you are, taking my scallops home, cooking it for breakfast. And I just love coming down here in the morning. A bit of monkfish? Yes, please. And there's one customer who turns up regular as clockwork. Here's Bob. Come on in. We'll sit there alongside now for the, for the rest of the time I'm here. Bob may be an avid consumer of Tristan's fish, but not all of his patrons started out that way. He's converted me to fish. I never ate fish fish before this boat came. My Six family's always called yeah. me John West Julie because I'd only eat John West salmon out the tin. But he sort of tells me how to do it and how to cook it, and so lots of monkfish curry in our house now. My husband's made up because he loves to. The last port of call is a consignment of goodies for one of Brixham's most popular restaurants. Hi, hi, Craig. Hello, Hello mate. I've got some spanking fish for you, mate. Hey, hey. I've got some uh, some place, some Dover soles, and a bit of monk as well. This morning? Yeah. This no, this morning, mate. Fresh as, fresh this morning. Look at that. Looks better when it's on a cutting board, doesn't it? Proper job. Right, I'm going to leave you to it. Yeah. And I'll come back and taste it in a bit. Nice one. <laughs> well on, Craig. Cheers, Catch you later, mate. Tristan supplies exclusively to the Prince William, and it's the perfect partnership. It's a super fresh. That's why we use him. So um, straight off the boat. So you can't get any better out of the bay, really. So as a chef, it gives us so much scope. Gives the customer a lot of variety. So everyone's happy. Be getting this fresh quality fish every day. It's perfect. So. Or want to be anywhere else. We like to keep it simple with the fish because with it being so fresh, there's not really much point messing about with it. You don't need to overdo flavours or anything because the quality's there itself. There you go. We've got fillets of place, buttered samphire, for cape and nut brown butter. Um, three hours ago, that was still in the sea. It's a dish fit for a hungry fisherman. This is quite a thing. So, I, yeah, it'd be nice to actually sit down and eat the food that I've provided. So I'll actually see what, feel like what the customers do. But um, it's my own fish, so I feel a bit proud, actually. Yeah, yeah then skip. I don't, bud. Get your gear around yeah. that. Enjoy. Oh, mate. That's top stuff, mate. Being a fisherman, it's even better when you come to the restaurant and taste your own fish. Boats right there. Restaurant's there. Less than six hours old. Can't taste any better. Ready for a snooze now. <laughs> Not far from Newquay, on the north coast of Cornwall, steam engineer Sam Henwood is finishing off work on the one and only replica of Richard Trevithick's Puffing Devil, the world's first high-pressure steam locomotive. We've put a new gasket into the end plate. 
uh, changed a few of the bolts, reconditioned a couple of the steam taps. But will all Sam's elbow grease help the replica puffing devil pass this crucial 10-year boiler inspection? When we've trialled the boiler, we've found a few bolts leak, and you tighten them up, seal them up, and another bolt seems to leak. So, yeah, hopefully it'll be all right. It'll be a tense wait for Sam as eagle-eyed inspector Dave Worthers arrives to administer the two-part test. Are you ready to go? Yeah, we'll turn the hose on if you want. Yeah, you had a few uh, leaks uh, up to now. Yeah, the bolts are playing up a little bit. First up is the hydraulic test, where the boiler is filled with cold water before a hydraulic pump is fitted to pressurise the boiler. What I'd want Sam to do now, bring that up to pressure. We need to test it at 165, one and a half times its maximum. 120 on there now. Using cold water under pressure is the safest way of checking the boiler for leaks. If it was in steam, it would be a different animal because steam will expand. When it hits atmosphere, it expands 1,600 times. Basically, you've got a, a, a bomb on your hands. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot safer. It's so far so good, as the boiler is holding pressure with no major leakage. Wonderful. It's looking very good. Now safe in the knowledge she won't actually explode, Dave deems the engine ready to raise steam. You can set fire to it. Yeah, all right. You'll start to hear the engine come to life and they all have their own little quirks and traits. And as the pressure increases, so do excitement levels in the yard. 85. It's coming up, Sam. It's got a bit of ambiance with the darkness and all the rest of it, isn't it? With the boiler attaining and maintaining pressure, Dave gives the go-ahead for Sam to open the regulator. And the devil's engine roars into life. Quite a nice thing right next to the chimney when you can hear the exhaust thumping away and getting covered on a bit of steam and oil splattering at you. Quite happy with that, yeah. For Dave, it's now a matter of monitoring the puffing devil to make sure she sustains pressure. And after a short while, the results are in. Very good, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The work, the work that's been done is, is all nice and dry, and all the bolts, uh, all the end caps. Safety valves are right, pressure gauge is correct. Yeah, it's all, a, it's all good to go. Pretty good, I think. It's all looking dry, so we can't be more happy than that, really. We've got a little bit of work to do, but that won't stop it being signed off, I'm sure. No, it's fine. It's um, good. So if you're at society, you can have it back then. A few days later, perched above the coast at Perrinporth Airfield, Sam can finally return the replica Puffing Devil to her costumed custodians. It really is windy and freezing cold, but the guys are all here to run the engine out for the first time and hopefully it'll be all right. It's a very special moment for the Trevithic Society to have her back where she belongs. Everything clear? You OK? Yeah. Do you know what to grab hold of? Yeah. And to welcome her return, Steersman John Woodward and the crew are all frocked up. Just to get into the field of things, this is more like the, what they would have dressed at the time. Look the part. Oh, it's been, a, what, a year and a half since uh, the engine's run, so it's nice to be back. Right, ready? Yeah. Powering into life, the renowned replica majestically chugs through the Cornish landscape. Great, isn't it? Reminiscent of Richard Trevithick's original engine as he made history on Christmas Eve in 1801, going up Camberwood Hill, coming down. I've never actually seen it move too much before, and to see how far it travels every stroke of the piston is quite remarkable, really. And it does put on a good turn of speed as well. As the crew guide her home from her first run out, 
they're properly stoked with how well she's performed. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Engine's going smoothly. No uh, unexpected squeaks or trouble with it. No, I think Sam's done a really brilliant job here. No problems. And for the engine, just go out and work the first time. Really brilliant. Good. For Cornishman Sam, the hard work is done. And he can take pride in the knowledge that he's restored a little hunk of history back to the place he calls home. To have the opportunity to get back in running condition the Trevivic engine, which symbolizes Cornwall, it's a real honor and a privilege, really. It's good to go now for 10 years, and hopefully there'll be generations that get the chance to look after it after these guys have hung up their big, long white socks, I guess, so yeah. <laughs> Next time on Devon and Cornwall, winemaker Simon weeds out the ingredients for his next vintage. You are getting a proper, genuine taste of Devon. Regatta racers Terry and Brenda go all out for victory. Oh, we want to come first, without a doubt. There's no, there's no two ways about that. We're in it to win it. And wheelwright Greg restores a vintage cycle. Bike wheels, they're really hard to get right. These are probably the hardest wheels I've made for a little while. But with plenty of bumps in the road. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's bloody hard work. <laughs>